This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. It is my great pleasure to welcome back uh, Professor um, Selene Tsoma. Uh, many of you will recall that she was a um, long table speaker back at the beginning of March. And the topic, as um, those of you who were with us then um, know, is really quite vast. So she is back today to continue to talk to us about nomos and nomisma, the monetary policy of the Greek city. Um, for those of you who weren't with us uh, before, I will reintroduce Professor Toma. She is a full professor at um, the National and Cappadocian University of Athens, where in fact she did her undergraduate work and an MA before going off to uh, the University of Paris for Sorbonne, where she did a PhD as well as her habilitation in ancient Greek history. Um, she was for almost a decade a researcher at the National Hellenic Research Foundation before uh, becoming a staff member in the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Athens, where she's been since 2009. Um, she has published widely on ancient Greek coinage, of course, but also on epigraphy and history. And recently, in fact, she finished a massive two-volume study of uh, Kosaira, or Kekera in Greek, um, looking at the history, the prosopography, and society of the Greek city um, from essentially its foundation to late antiquity. So, Seleni, it's a great pleasure to have you back and very much looking forward to the continuation of Nomos and Nomisma. So, it's all yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Peter, and for the invitation. Um, uh, today, we are going to see um, a legislation introduced not by cities, but by uh, wider, um, let's say, organizations as uh, the Athenian uh, first, the, the first Athenian alliance and the Amphictyonic Council. So I will begin with the um, coinage decree, the famous uh, um, coinage decree uh, of the fifth century BC. BC. This is one of the most controversial pieces of evidence for 5th century Athens and its hegemony. It has been widely discussed by epigraphists, numismatists, and historians. I will begin with the story we all know about the decree and then turn to the way I propose to understand it. In a passage from Aristophanes, Birds, produced in 4. 14 BC, the decree seller presents a decree according to which no felokokigia stizde tis aftis metrisi ke stathmisi ke psifismasi kathaper olofixi. The clod kuklanders are to use the self same measures, weights, and decrees as the olofixians. But in the Todna edition of 1857, suggesting amending psifismacy to nomismacy, which was adopted by a number of scholars, but not by Sommerstein and Henderson in their translations of 1987 and 2000. It was on the basis of the amendation of Berg uh, that uh, Ulrich von Wilamowitz Mellendorf hypothesized the existence of a decree well before it started um, surfacing in the form of epigraphic fragments. The passage appears to allude, allude to a clause in a decree issued by the Athenians for their allies, but comic distortion makes it risky to reconstruct the actual provisions from these lines. A fragment of a decree discovered at Smyrna and contained language similar to that found in the Aristophanes passage and was published by Baumeister in 1955. Other fragments from Sifnos, Simi, Kos, Aphitis, Olbia, and possibly Amaxitos have been published since. The texts of the fragments appear to overlap in certain pieces in place, sorry, making it possible to reconstruct the main clauses of the decree and their sequence. The composite text of David Lewis in IG1Q uh, Miltos Hadzopoulos and Osborne Rhodes, 2017, 
contain 14 clauses, but the first and last are so fragmentary that any restorations are inevitably speculative. The way the decree was interpreted is well known to all of us. The leading Russian scholar, Vilamovich Melendorf, proposed the interpretation we all learn from school books to university to postgraduate seminars. The decree banned the meet meeting of colleges of the city members of the Athenian Alliance, it est the cities of Euboia, the islands of the Aegean Sea, Trace and Western and parts of Asia Minor. The impact of Vilamovic in classical studies is well known, and accordingly, his interpretation of the decree became canonical. Vilamovic was obviously influenced by, in his interpretation of the decree by the recent creation of a common coinage for the German Empire and found a classical precedent for the monetary unification of 1871. Epigraphists followed by numismatists adopted the same interpretation and the debate concentrated on the date. Such a measure, allegedly revealing the imperial character and policy of Athens, was first associated with Kallias, Timon's brother-in-law, the richest Athenian of his day. The three-bar sigma of the fragment from Kos was the main argument, as it was believed to have disappeared from Athenian documents, official documents, in 447 BC. Therefore, a date in the 440s was proposed. There were several objections to this early date, summarized by Hadropoulos in his third article about the new fragment from Aphitis. When Hort evidenced the Decadrach Hort showed that this date was untenable and had to be lowered, a date in 425, previously also proposed, was adopted. With a date in 425, it seemed obvious that Cleon and his friends, well known for their views about their lies, were behind the decree. One recalls that it was his relative, probably his son-in-law, Thudipos, that who was involved in the assessment of the same year, 425, and this assessment, we all know, imposed an increased tribute upon members and members in revolt, and prob probably not members, of the empire. Harold Mattingly wrote a number of articles to support the date in 425, which was also retained by all participants, with one exception, in the Oxford Conference of 2004, which remains unpublished. In this conference, Lisa Callet, following Kavignac, supported the date she proposed in 2001. It as the second part of the four tens and the association of the decree with the Ecosti. According to Callet, the decree was quickly revoked and left no traceable impact on the coinages of the cities of the so-called Athenian Empire. Callet was followed by Kroll and partly by Osborne Rhodes and Rhodes in 2017. A recent scholarship cast doubt on the traditional interpretation of the decree. Maria Schenhammer, in a summary of her unpublished thesis on the Athenian coinage decree, proposed the interpretation of nomismacy in the relevant nomismacy in the relevant clause of the decree as coinage standard. For Thomas Figuera, the allied state paid their foros in Athenian coins. This procedure presented practical advantages over the complexity in exchange and awkwardness of making payments in a variety of local currencies. Olivier Picard also interpreted the decree as a technical financial measure. Simmons rejected the view that the decree represents a crucial stage in the transformation of the link to empire. According to Simmons, the decree had little impact on the way Athenian imperial finance actually functioned. Lisa Khaled considered the decree um, not as an oppressive measure, political weapon, but as a measure to facilitate exchange and transactions in the commercial realm. In this paper, I will propose to adopt a reading and understanding of the decree as a technical financial measure. This interpretation takes under consideration evidence from hordes, the absence of numismatic 
evidence from means for a break in coinage in the allied cities, the clauses of the decree, as well as those of IG 1Q90, and of course, literary evidence. As earlier versions of this paper were presented in various occasions before the two, two, 2020 publication of the relevant monograph of Lisa Callet and Jack Kroll, I will try not to repeat things that were made clear by their research and were also part of these earlier presentations of mine. Now, hold evidence. With the exception of Euboia, whose cities minted coinage during the early decades of the 5th century and later stopped, evidence for hoards with Attic silver in all other areas where cities members of the First Athenian League occurred is almost unexistent. This was stressed by Kovar Konuk for Asia Minor and is not challenged by the so-called decadent from El Mali, Pamphylia, and a new hoard which contains hundreds of Athenian coins also from Asia Minor, because both, and maybe some others, were buried within the territories of the Persian Empire. All specialists of Macedonia and Thrace know that there is practically no hard evidence to show that Athenian coins played an important role in the North Aegean at any period in the second half of the 5th century BC. The 2006 Code from the excavations of Methoni also does not challenge this image, Methoni not being a member of the Dimian League until the late 430s, and the whole dates from around 450. However, two passages in Thucydides and one in Xenophon as well as all mentions of the minor money Lysander sent to Sparta, reveal that uh, during the last uh, years of the Peloponnesian War, Athenian owls played a significant role as a means of payment to soldiers and those who rode in the Athenian and Peloponnesian fleets. This is also reflected in Aristophanes' lines from his frogs. Athenian coins had a good reputation due to the purity of their metal. This was the reason they were preferred by Greeks and barbarians. The story narrated by Claudius Elianus about an Attic drachma being the price for the man who catches the king of the Welks at Byzantium might also refer to this period. As owls circulated in the Aegean during the last years of the war, to explain their absence from hordes buried within the territories of the Arche, one needs to take into account the huge money, money that Lysander sent to Sparta at the very end of the Peloponnesian War, the arrival of Attic currency in the Gaza of the satraps of Asia Minor and the Persian king, and in this way, in the territories of the Achaemenid Empire well before the final years of the war. And it is tempting to explain in this way the significant hordes that were buried within the territories of the Persian uh, state, like the Decadrachm horde and other unpublished hordes. The use also of Attic silver coinage to provide metal for the production of local coinages, meta-analysis should provide uh, more evidence about this hypothesis. And of course, the fact that Athenian coins were not legal tender outside Athens and had to be exchanged for local coins, as was the case during the 4th century BC. Evidence for the 4th century derives from both Xenophon, who also mentioned their good exchange rate, the famous passage of um, Poroi, and Apollodorus of Acarne, the son of Pasir. Thus, hot evidence does not at all support the hypothesis of a wide circulation and extensive, let alone exclusive use of Athenian owls within the frontiers of the so-called Athenian alliance. Means, as we all know, 
On the basis of an early date in the 440s for the decree and its interpretation as imposing a ban on local coinage, Stanley Robinson's famous article published in 1949 proposed an end for almost all coinages minted in the cities that were members of the Athenian alliance, circa 449 BC. Baron, writing in the 1960s about the coinage of Samos, proposed a gap in the early 430s for Samos in relation with the end of the Samian revolt when Athens conquered Samos and obliged her to observe the current decree. As the publication of the Decadam Code in 1987 refuted this early date for the end of a number of coinages, dates in the mid 420s for an eventual end of these coinages began to be adopted as had been previously proposed by Eric Sleben and Mattingly. In the early 1990s, Nicholas Hardwick followed the same path and proposed a break in the coin production of Kios, circa 425, as a result of the decree. Mattingly made a similar assumption for Acanthus, Maronia, and Menvi, and Chrysanthaki Nagle for Abdera. The evidence from Minsk has been further exploited by Tom Figuera. This subject was treated thoroughly and seriously by Jack Roy and Lisa Carlin. Uh, the results of their study that you all know are very similar to mine, and I will present these results of my studies, previous studies, briefly. While working on the silver um, coinage of Olynthus, the Chalcedian League, and other similar coinages emanating uh, from cities of the Chalcedic Peninsula, I was not obliged to take the ACD, the Athenian coinage decree, under consideration simply because the Chalcedians of Thrace were the enemies par excellence of Athens in this area, and let me stress this, never surrendered. In a short 1997 publication, I proposed to explain the change of the standard of Acanthus in relation with the need of these new allies of all enemies of Athens to pay together with the Chalcedians and Perdicas II of Macedonia for Brasidas soldiers, as we are informed about the Macedonian king from uh, and the allies from Thucydides. Sometime later, I proposed on the basis of style the continuation of the silver coinage of Mende after Cleon's intervention, and I was happy that Jonathan Kagan provided more evidence to strengthen my arguments on the same direction. Working with the silver coinage of Maronea and taking under consideration Mattingly's 2002, 2000 publication about Maronia and Menry, I paid no attention to the decree because it already seemed obvious to me that all attempts to posit a break in silver production at any date were based on preconceived ideas about the decree and its date. This was also the conclusion of the thorough numismatic study by Jack Kroll. I would like to add some more evidence from T Trace. The Thasian starter underwent successive um, uh, uh, reductions to achieve the weight of 8.6, the weight of the Arctic starter by greater phase it est during the years of the war. Apollonia and Mesanvaria seem to have adopted a weight standard that strongly recalls uh, the um, attic. What needs to be retained from this analysis of silver coinages issued by members of the empire are two findings. Numismatic scholars felt the need to associate the decree with presumed breaks of coins production, thus facilitating the task of dating different periods and finding firm termini ante them. All attempts to, to locate interruptions in the monetary production production of this or that city, however, remain highly speculated and are almost always based on these preconceived ideas. Change of, of standard did occur, but these do not always concern the Attic standard and are either related to historical circumstances deriving from war expenditure or to a change of gold, sil gold sil the gold-silver ratio. There are also cases of cities that extract coinages on the Attic standard, such as Acanthus down to have alliance with Brasidas, Mende down to the 420s, Thassos, Mesambria, and Apollonia. 
some of these might be related to needs emerging from the Athenian coinage decree. As David Lewis pointed out more than 30 years ago, uh, I'm not sure how in the circumstances we really expect that a decree can do anything to date any coinage. So I will show you a uh, Euboian Attic standard, Euboian standard of uh, the Chalcedians of Trace, circa 450, Olynthus, circa 432, and a small change of types because the previous one created confusion uh, on the Milesian standard. So now let's turn to the decree. The, because the first clause is very fragmentary, I will start with the second one. The second clause instructs the Notamir to record the name, the names most probably of cities. If they do not do so, they will be prosecuted. There is mention of the court, Iliaea of the Thesmothete, and most probably a penalty for each one of them. The third clause applies to officials in the cities, uh, citizens and foreigners and threatens very harsh penalties for failure to carry out the terms of the decree, loss of rights, of civil rights, and confiscation of property. The next clause provides that if there are no Athenian magistrates in the cities, the local magistrates shall act. These are also threatened with heavy penalties if they do not carry out the terms of the decree. We know now from the new Aphitis fragment that they were also threatened with atimia, loss of political rights. The fifth surviving clause is very fragmentary and includes the expression no less than a half, mia elatoni inisi, a reference to a number of drachmas per minor, a reference to exchange kata Latin, and a reference to guilt, enochus in a kata this clause is key for the interpretation of our decree. It mentions the means for silver coins, our Eurocopian, the rate based on drachmas and minus, the verb meaning to convert, followed by the phrase or be liable, which must indicate a penalty for not carrying out the provision. There is also mention of the cities and the first letters of the verb prato, pratuse. One of the meanings of this verb is to exact payment from one. In two passages of Thucydides, both from book eight, this verb is associated with the payment of tribute. The next clause contains the verb to hand over, followed by a reference to the special fund of Athena and Ephestos. In the same clause, there is mention of a union that is left, perigignite, and the generals. What follows is the standard formula for an entrenchment clause, which appears to have been followed by a legal procedure for those who, vi who violate the phrase, the, the clause, sorry. This clause contains the money that is left over and is mentioned in the previous phrase. The seventh clause contain, contains instructions to elect heralds and send them to the four districts of the empire. These four districts have a parallel in the decree of Clinias. There appears also to be a penalty at the end of the clause for generals who do not send heralds. The next clause contains instructions, contains a publication, sorry, a formula, uh, instructing uh, officials in the cities to inscribe the text on a stone stele and place it in the agora of the city, while the epistate should place the stele in front of the mint and the coinage. The ninth clause contains an instruction to each event. Now, the tenth clause is also central for the interpretation of the decree but breaks off at the crucial point, as always. The decree orders the secretary of the council to, to add a phrase to the oath of the council, which begin, if anyone, sorry, 
means silver coinage in the cities and does not use Athenian nomismata and measures and weights. This takes one of this takes one of the standard forms of an Athenian law, with a substantive provision in the protasis, followed by legal procedure in the apodosis. On the other hand, this is an oath which should contain in the apodosis a verb in the future, in the first person singular, as in other oaths preserved in public documents on stone. The best example is, of course, the agreement with the city of Chalkis that used to be dated after the revolt 446, and now they propose date in the 420s. Now, anyway, they propose date in the 420s for everything. Now, the best... Um, This um, treaty, this agreement, contains a series of promises, all expressed in verbs in the first person singular and in the future indicative. Another example is the agreement with chaos. We are going to see the oaths later. The two last surviving clauses are known only from the copy of Smyrna, which mentions that Clearchus proposed the Athenian standard decree on the basis of the second affidavit fragment, which ends with the protasis of clause 10 and the vacat, uh, what followed in the copy of Smyrna was followed probably a reader of the first one. Now, the 11th clause mentions foreign coins, Xenicon Argyrion, the city, Tinpoli, and the silver meat, Togirokopion. Togirokopion. The last clause concerns the pistate, their duty to publish lists of something in front of the mint, Eberstein to Agiocopio, for anyone who, lose, who wishes to look at these lists. It also mentions the total amount of foreign silver, not counting something that is missing. Ever since Vilamovic scholars, with few exceptions, have generally interpreted this decree as containing a ban on the minting of silver coins by the allies of Athens. There are several objections to this view. We have already seen hard evidence and evidence for mints. Some more objections are the following. There is no example in the ancient Greek world of one state forbidding another state to mint coins. By contrast, there is evidence, the law of Nicophon and the Isopolitia decrees of Smyrna about cities allowing the circulation, cities or uh, what is the, uh, the Katikia in uh, the Magnesia under Sipilos in the mid third century BC, allowing the circulation of other currencies in the territories under their jurisdiction. This was also the same with federal states. As we all know, Philip II never closed the means of Greek cities, while even the most powerful Hellenistic monarchs never stopped a Greek polis from minting coins. The preserved fragments of the decree do not explicitly mention a ban on minting coins. Scholars have restored a penalty close in the missing apodosis of close 10, but there are several reasons to reject this kind of restoration. If this were the main clause of a law, this would be a plausible supplement, but what the clause comes from an oath contained in the law. Furthermore, and this is very important, the consul did not have the power to inflict any punishment beyond a fine of 500 drachms and could not put anyone to death without a trial. In the procedure of the Sangelia to the consul, the consul only made a preliminary vote about whether to have the case go to court. In the decree of Clinias that laid down strict regulations for the collection of tribute from the allies and uh, there bringing a current panoply to the Panathenia, the procedure for dealing with offenders reveals that the consul's power was certainly limited. The phrasing from the oath in the so-called Law of the Mophandes in Andosides on the Mysteries 197, that was recently proposed to be restored as the apodosis of the protasis of clause number uh, 11, must also be rejected because this document is a forgery as it has been recently shown. This rules out the supplement dealing with putting someone to death. Thus, all previous restorations, including the death penalty, 
um, need to be rejected as well and where in fact what Ernst Bedian called history from square brackets. Finally, in other oaths shown by the Council and Athenian officials, one never finds any mention of punishment. We will come back to this clause later. If the clause to be added to the oath did contain a ban on allied coinage, the wording of the protestes makes no sense. The clause re reads, if someone strikes silver coin, coinage in the cities and does not use the nomismata and weights and measures of the Athenians. If this were a ban expressed in the normal way found in Athenian laws, it should be, if anyone means coins, silver coins, there is a penalty, or there is a procedure to bring the person who violates the law to court. Why the entire phrase about, phrase about not using Athenian nomismata, weights and measures? Close eight calls for copies of the decree to be placed in the agora and the pistate are to place it in front of the mint of possible coinage. The number now of copies of the decree from different cities of the empire cannot reach this clause as far as the copies will be placed in the agora consent. We are not told explicitly by the decree if the mint at Athens is meant, if the mints in the cities are meant, or if both are in this clause. If the means in the cities are meant, and the decree bans the minting of silver coinage by their lives, all such means would be closed. There would be no point in putting a decree in front of a deserted site. If the mint of Athens is meant, this was for specific reasons that we might with the help of clauses 5, 6, 11, and 12. The mention of the pistate, I believe, indicates that the mint of Athens is meant. Now, in the so-called second Athenian coinage decree, the Lorion is mentioned, as well as the pistate, the verb catalatin, the same coin or coinage, another coinage, the consul, and also expressions such as keantis alos, opos an givnete, apo ton trapezon, archodes en keramien. This decree dates post 424 3 and if the coinage decree bans the use of other coinages to their lives and dates after 438 or from the 420s, why then the decree from the years following 424 includes provisions related to other coins or coinages and conversion of coinage? Despite the main uncertainty about the decree, one thing is fairly certain. Clause 5 refers to a process of conversion and mentions an amount expressed in drachmas per minor. The fragmentary decree cited above that we mentioned above also links the council with the conversion of coinage. A link with the payment of tribute is also suggested by the mention of the linotami of clause 2. We know that these officials were responsible for collecting the tribute and making reports to the council. A relationship with meeting coinage can be observed in the mention of the fund of Athena and Ephesus uh, in the fragment of Aphitis. This fund is also mentioned in the low and silver coinage of 354-3 and it was a significant fund and there is evidence for its leaks with Lorion. It was supposed to receive silver that was left over after the conversion of foreign currency into Attic currency mentioned in the previous clause and the payment of the agio. This conversion procedure brought profit to the city of Athens and this profit it entered the fund of Athens and of Athena and Ephesus. According to the entrenchment clause that followed, this money was not supposed to be borrowed or serve any other purpose. Now, let's turn to oaths. All Parthenian officials in matters regarding their lives give their lives guarantees and do not threaten with penalties. They also place restrictions on the actions of Athenian officials. Penalties for allied citizens are placed in the main clauses of laws, not in oaths. The decree of Clinias presents a good example. If any Athenian or ally does wrong, concerning the tribute which the cities must write on a tablet for those bringing it and sent to Athens, against him it shall be permitted to whoever wishes of the Athenians and their lives to write an accusation to the Britannis. 
the Britanni shall introduce it into the council, with the, the council within three or five days from when the accusation is made, or they shall be penalized by 10,000 drachms each. When a man is condemned by the council, something, have final power over him, but shall bring out to the people about him. If he's judged to be in the wrong, the Britannia shall institute a debate to judge what he should suffer in his person or pay. Like the oath of the council and the dicaste in the decree regulating relations with Titus, the oath in this decree should provide an assurance. I shall not expel the Chalcedians from Titus, nor shall I uproot their city. I shall deprive no individual of civic rights, not punish any with exile, not take any prisoner, not execute any, not confiscate the money of anyone, not condemned in court without the authority of the Athenian people. There is also similar evidence from other oaths of Athenian magistrates during the 5th and the 4th century BC. From the 5th century, we have the treaty between Athens and the cities of the Boteans, dated to 422 BC. You have the, the text in ancient Greek. This is also an oath of the council and the gentlemen. From the 4th century, we have the treaty of Alphagias, one more, with Halkis, which guarantees Halkis freedom, autonomy, no payment of tribute, and no presence of an Athenian garrison or magistrate. This dates from 378 uh, 7 BC. From 375 4 dates the treaty with Corsaira. And from 363 2, the treaty with the cities of Kerch. In their oath, the Athenian generals were admitted in the following way I shall not have no grudges or fathers against any of the kings. Nor shall I kill or make an exile any of the kings who abide by the oath and this agreement, but I shall bring them into the alliance like the other allies. But if anyone commits an act of revolution in chaos, contrary to the oaths and the agreement, I shall not allow him by any craft or contrivance as far as possible. If anyone does not wish to live in chaos, I shall allow him to live where he, wherever he wishes in the allied cities and enjoys enjoy his own property. In the treaty with Alevas of Larissa and the Thessalians of 361, the generals and the consuls swear, I shall go in support with all my strength as far as possible if anyone goes against the kingdom of the Thessalians for war or overthrows the archon whom the Thessalians have appointed or sets up a tyranny in Thessaly. We are during the years that Thessaly suffered because of the uh, tyrants of uh, Ferai. What could this assurance be in our coinage decree? That if anyone in the allied cities mints silver coins and does not use Athenian standard, coinage standards, weight standards, and measurement standards, standards, I, the member of the council, will convert it and will not exact a conversion fee of more than a certain percentage, close five. It has the established rate. In other words, the decree does not forbid the allies to continue to mint silver coins, but insists that if the cities do not meet on the Athenian standard, they will pay only the conversion fee for any tribute paid in coinage minted on a non-Athenian standard. Such restoration is corroborated by the last phrase of the crucial, previous crucial clause 10, including the oath, as well as the last clause of the fragment from Smyrna. In this clause, we have mentions of the foreign currency, um, the mint at Athens, a steel in front of the mint, the pistate, and the total sum not counting something that is missing. The sum not to count was most probably the money resulting from the conversion that found its way to the fund of Athena and Diphestos. The tribute paid in foreign currency, Xenicon Argyrion, could be melted down and used to strike Athenian coins. 
this restoration best fits the context and also does not clash with the numismatic evidence. It is also consistent with other legislation um, about coinage in other Greek cities during other periods of Greek history. Now, to understand the decree and to arrive at a better reconstruction of the key clause in the oath of the Council, one must consider the financial needs of Athens of the Athenian Empire. Even since the foundation of the alliance, the Athenians collected tribute from dozens of cities who paid with coins and maybe sometimes also with previous objects. It has been recently proposed by Utevaptebek to link a number of coinages issued by tribes from the area between the Strymon and the Nestor's rivers to the tribute paid to the Delian League. The Athenians also needed to make payments to their own officials and to those rowing in the fleet who came from many different cities. The Athenians could not collect tribute in dozens of different denominations and make payments in dozens of different denominations. Such a situation would have been made keeping accounts virtually impossible. Apollodos explicitly states how complicated and difficult it was to keep record of the money he exchanged and spent. I was ready to recon it up item by item while I had by me as a as, um, witnesses sorry to the expenditure the sailors and the marines and the rowers in order that if he disputed anything that means the successor who didn't want to arrive and and take the, the trial the trial i might recruit him at once everything had been recorded so accurately by me that i had written down not only the disbursements themselves but also the objects for which the money had been spent, the nature of the service rendered, what the price was in the coinage of what country, what city the payment was made, and what the loss in exchange was, in order that I might be able to be, give convincing proof to my successor if he thought any files and tries were being made against him. The Athenians needed to collect tribute in coins minted on one standard or converted on one standard and make payments on coins minted on this standard. For payments, they used mainly the Attic drachma. This was the reason the Athenian drachma was the coin of the Peloponnesian, that the Peloponnesian coins wanted to be paid in during the last years of the war. One might almost say that if we did not have the fragments of the decree, we would have had to invent such a decree to explain why in all Athenian documents from 450s onwards, all figures are given without mention of uh, uh, um, issuing authorities. Unlike the Spartan War Fund, in the Athenian financial documents, almost all amounts are calculated in Athenian denominations with one exception. During later period, silver coinages that were issued to serve military needs of allies were struck on the same standard as the Sin coinage, uh, Persian Okean standard, the Simachicon of the late 4th and of the late 3rd, 2nd century BC, as well as Alexander's and Lysimachim during the Hellenistic period, Attic standard. One recalls a passage of Dio uh, Cassius. A, a fictional speech allegedly held by Mekinas, uh, who there asserts the need for a single system of standardized measures and colleges around the empire. empire. The need the Roman faiths in the first, late first century BC, AD, sorry, was almost felt by the Athenians when they had to arrange the financial matters of their empire. empire. And for this, uh, served most probably as a mom who served most probably as a model was the great king who was asking his subjects to calculate the tribute on the Babylonian standard for silver and, and the Euboian standard for gold. For the function of its own empire, Athens needed a reference coinage, and this was its own silver coin. I'm moving now to the date of the degree. We all know the debate about the date as well as the most significant mistake of methodology committed by epigraphists in their attempt to date it. Compa they compared letters, letter shapes of Athenian documents and of copies of the decree from different cities. I believe for its date, two things need to be taken under consideration. First, the decree itself, 
and second, the literary evidence. There is a terminus post quem for the decree, and it derives from the decree itself, the four districts of the Athenian Empire that point to the years following 438 BC. The same number of districts occurs also in the decree of Clinias. As we all know, five districts occurred between 443 and 439, following the order Ionia, Hellespont, Trace, Caria, and the islands. Between 438 and 432, we have four districts, Ionia, Islands, Hellespont, Trace. From 427, the Actaean cities taken from Mytilene are added, and that in the Thudipos decree, and also in a decree of 422 BC, we have the order Islands, Ionia, Hellespont, cities of Acta, Trace, of later date, is a, a, a one I, IG 1Q100 uh, with the order Islands, Hellespont, Ionia, Trace, Exynos. In the Africans fragment, um, the districts are four with the order Islands, Ionia, Hellespont, Trace. If we combine this evidence, number of districts and their sequence, we have dates post 430. Let's now turn to the literary evidence. Aristophanes' verse was presented in the Dionysia of 414. It is in the spring month of Elafivolion, March, April. The allusion is clearly to weights, measures, and coin standard, and the play was presented while Athenian forces were operating in Sicily. It was in the spring of the following year that Demosthenes was supposed to cross to Sicily with men and money, while the Lacedaemonians were preparing the invasions of, invasion of Africa. A passage of Thucydides, quite well known to all of them, describes the situation in Attica after the Lacedaemonian invasion and the establishment of the, in the newly built port of the Selea. Besides the transport of provisions from Euboea, which had before been carried on so much more quickly over land by the Selea from Oropos, was now affected at great cost by sea round Sunni. Everything the city required to be imported from abroad, and instead of a city, it became a fortress. Summer and winter, the Athenians were worn out by having to keep guard on the fortifications during the day by turns, by night altogether, the cavalry accepted at the different military posts or upon the wall. But what most oppressed them was that they had two wars at once and had thus reached a pitch of frenzy, which no one would have believed possible if he had heard of it before it had come to pass. For could anyone have imagined that even when besieged by the Peloponnesians entrenched in Attica, they would still, instead of withdrawing from Sicily, stay on their besieging in like manner Sinochirus, a town taken as a town? in no way inferior to Athens, or would so thoroughly upset the Hellenic estimate of their <laughs> the spectacle of people which at the beginning of the world, some thought might hold out one year, some two, none more than three, if the Peloponnesians invaded their country, now 17 years after the first invasion, after having already suffered from all the evils of war, going to Sicily and undertaking a new war, nothing inferior to what which they already had with the Peloponnesians. This causes the great losses from the Silea and the other heavy charges that fell upon them, produced their financial embarrassment. And it was at this time that they imposed upon their subject, instead of the tribute, the tax of the tw 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 20, upon all imports and exports by sea, which they thought would bring them in more money. Their expenses have been now uh, the same as at first, but having grown with the war while their revenues deceived. It was because of all the problems described by Thucydides that the Athenians decided to replace tribute with the Ecosti, a payment of 5% tax on trade in all cities of the Alliance and Athens. This was in autumn 413. It was in this way that they hoped to gain money for what Thucydides describes as the two wars. One recalls that Athens had to send 300 
talents in summer 414 and then 120 in winter 414 413. With the introduction of this tax upon all imports and exports by sea, all these imports and exports by sea should be calculated in a uniform way and the tax should be paid in a common currency. This currency was Arctic silver, while the Arctic weights and measures would serve to calculate these imports and exports. Arctic currency would serve the collection of both the treaty and the tax, but the mention of weights and measures in the decree and the need to use this can only be explained in relation with the ECOSTI, with nothing else. We know nothing about the details and the mechanism with which the Athenians collected these taxes, but this is not a reason to deny uh, the relation of the decree with the ECOSTI. In fact, the decree provides some information about how the Athenians all their lives, especially the collection of tribute, uh, the Linotami everyone's more involved, close to. There is also mention of officials of the League, Athenians or foreigners, close three, as well as local officials, close four, election of heralds, close seven, and destruction to its herald, close nine, as well as instruction to the League of City officials and the Epistate for the publication of the decree in the cities of the Empire and Athens, close eight. As far as the so-called chronological discrepancy between the allusion to the decree in Aristophanes, early spring 414, and the introduction of the Ecosti later, it seems to be clear that this decision emerged after public discussion and probably very long public discussion and debate. The Athenians were spending a lot of money before and after summer 415 BC. They said in total 440, uh, talents before the dispatch of Demosthenes' fleet, while Nicias was stressing that the Athenians were in a better shape than the Syracusans in summer 413 BC, a little bit before his execution, and was later this summer ready to agree with the Syracusans on behalf of the Athenians to repay whatever money the Syracusans had spent upon the war if they would let his army go and offered until the money was paid to give Athenians as hostages, one for every talent. This uh, tax did not uh, last and the tribute was established in 410. One wonders if this establishment of tribute can be associated with the so-called second Athenian coin um, uh, decree uh, that we have seen. With this fragmentary decree, which was of very significant size, the city of Athens introduced legislation concerning payments at Athens and the allied cities, and Poles also to the exchange of gold for silver, but the text is too poorly preserved for us to uh, uh, assess its significance. This decree, as I said, also mentions as the ACD, Athenian institutions, Epistate and the Council, institutions of the city's members of the Athenian alliance, Archondes, no, term, the terms nomisma, the verb to denote exchange, and another element is the reference to the trapeze, a point in common with the law of Nicophon on silver coinage, which dates from 375 4 BC. There is a provision about exchange as well as what those who change their coins received, the same coinage or other coinage. The mention of Chrysion, Darix and Sisis in status is of interest and points to the increasing use of Chrysion for payments from 14, 418 BC. In 413-12, the treasurers of Athena paid out the enormous sum of 61,697 Sisis in status the equivalent of 250 talents. This is an indication that stocks of silver were now rapidly running out. I need to mention that with this interpretation in mind, one wonders about Aristophanes' choice to mention the decree uh, while presenting a comment in the Dionysia. We all know that the tribute was paid during uh, this occasion and celebration. Now, 
it is in this way that I propose to explain the decree and see this see it as a purely technical financial measure. Athenian imperialism and lack of respect for the autonomy of the Greek city-states who were members of the League certainly cannot be denied in general, but the coinage decree has nothing to do with either of these. More than a sign of despotism, the decree is a victim of anachronistic assumptions based on 19th century historical circumstances, it as the monetary unification of the German Reich in 1870. 871 under Prussian guidance. I will turn now, if you are not very tired, it will not be long, it's just one page, to the Amphictyonic decree. This is a dogma on the Amphictyons, and with this they order the equivalence of one Attic tetradarm to four drachms. The date was a subject of debate. Now we, it is finally fixed in 100, 115 BC, two years after the well-known scandal of 117 BC. With the meanings, things are more complicated. The Arctic tetradrachm of this period was the so-called new style silver tetradrachm, the Stephaniforon or Atikona given of the docu epigraphic documents this was issued in very significant quantities after the end of the Third Macedonian War and the grant of Delos to Athens by Rome. The question is, what were these drachms? It's a little bit bizarre to hear that an Attic tetragram is the equivalent of four drachms. Could the Amphictyons refer to drachms of reduced weight, a genetan weight, the genetan standard be in use at Delphi since the early 5th century BC? This was the standard of a number of coinages minted during this period, as well as of the Drachme Argirius Symmachicu, that were in fact triables of reduced Aegean weight. It has been assumed that its aim was to create an equivalence between this reduced Aegean weight and the Attic weight, or to readjust the weight of the silver drachm for 290 to 435. Uh, grams and of the bronze drachm from 233 to 290. An overvaluation of the Stephaniforic tetragram and an adjustment to the old Attic tetragram was also proposed. However, what seems uh, to be plausible, more plausible by far, is the explanation proposed by the first editor, Theodor Reinach. The dogma made the Arctic new style tetradams full legal tender of southern Greece together with the local silver currencies without asking for a conversion fee in transactions. It was in this way that the dogma that should be respected in the ethnic members of the council, Delphians, Thessalians, Phocians, Achaia, Theote, Magnetis from Dimitrias, Enianes, Malis, Iteria, Athenians, Euboreans, Locria, Pecnimidi, and Esperi, Dorians from the Metropolis, Perevi, and Dorians from the Peloponnese, took into consideration the monetary situation in these areas. To describe the situation, we need to turn to epigraphic and numismatic evidence from this period. Court evidence from this period revealed that the Athenian new style silver tetradrachms and drachms were parts of courts, but not only in Attica and Delos, uh, which belonged to Athens during this period, but also in Euboea, Naxos, Thessaly, Aetolia, Boeotia, Greece. There is epigraphic evidence from Boeotia uh, and Delphi about the use of the Attic currency in a number of transactions. Thus, the decision of the Amphictyons took under consideration the current situation in central Greece. During most of the second half of the second century, Attic currency was the most significant in this area. There were few other currencies that were either of earlier date but still circulated, silver coins of this year, Symmachicon and coinages on the reduced Aegean standard, or were on local standard as circulated locally, the Salian League. To conclude, epigraphic evidence discussed above combined with the relevant numismatic and literary evidence reveals that nomisma and nomos were linked and interconnected. All matters that concerned coinage were regulated by laws and decrees. All decisions that concerned coinage were taken by the issuing authority uh, and could apply in the area of its own jurisdiction. Coinage was a financial instrument par excellence and could be 
issued by minting authorities that could guarantee its metal and value with the aim of serving their needs, whatever these were, needs of the community itself or imposed by others. There were severe penalties for fraud while the issuing authorities were eager to punish counterfeiters, especially when the coins that were minting served the needs of the federal state, Dimi and the Achaean League, or were struck as part of an agreement between two cities. There is no evidence in this direction for the largest silver coinage of the Hellenistic period, issued mainly by cities on the two shores of the Aegean Sea, as well as in Trace and the Pontus, Alexander, and also Lysimene. Thank you very much. Eleni, that was a fantastic tour de force, as always. Um, and just when we thought that there was nothing left to say about the coinage decree, you've had you know a great deal to say. And in fact, I, I was really impressed, particularly by the um, notion that Vilimovic's interpretation was very much influenced by you know everything that happened with the German unification in 1871, which reminded me. Um, you know, what has been said about Ronald Symes' Roman Revolution book, which was published in 1939, that obviously seemed heavily influenced by mm -hmm. all the political situation in Europe in 1939. So really important to underscore how contemporary events and political whatever really does have an influence on the way that we as historians interpret, you know, these um, documents and other evidence from other times. Um, more than happy to open the floor to um, some questions if, 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 if you're still awake. I know that it's really quite late you now. Just one second now. Yeah, but uh, um, let me see if, if we do have any uh, questions. I Unfortunately, I can't at the moment see um, if there are any hands raised. So, uh, another chat, Peter. I'm sorry? Nothing in the chat yet. All right. All right. So far, uh, it doesn't look like we do have any um, questions or comments. Can I make a comment? I don't know how to read. Oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead, Uta, please. Um, I think the interesting question is really um, about one of evolution of this whole development, how um, initially right at the beginning of the Delian League after the Persian War, when the concept of tribute is very much a Persian, you know, comes right from this, that the early payments we get, um, you know, get, get sort of paid. Actually, sorry, is this sounds like, hang on one sec. Hang on one sec. Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan, we're sitting in the same room. Sorry about this. So yeah. um basically that initially you knew you, you can contribute in in um ships or uh timber in, in all sorts of things, including coins or silver of some sort. And I don't think at the beginning it is regulated, and I think there's a difference that comes in the middle of the century when suddenly it becomes clear that, you know, there has to be some regulation. And obviously this is unregulated, has nothing to do with the coinage decree, but actually the effect, the interesting thing is that we have all these different coinages minting both on the Persian side, interestingly, as this new horde has shown, as well as on, um, you know, the, the entire, um, Greek side of coins, and then suddenly this this gets reduced. You know, after 450, we have many fewer coinages and so on. And I think there is some connection there, at least for the coinages that are um, sort of 470 to let's say 460, 455, that might have something to do with the tribute. And hmm. um, would you what would you think about this? And that was my initial point that I had already expressed in print. Yes, you know, I think, uh, of course you are right. There are coinages that stop um, in the 460s, others stop in the 450s. Uh, there might be a change. We don't have, with a, so, such a light, late date for the coinage decree, uh, we don't have, uh, um, a, let's say, evidence for such a regulation. But uh, 
I think that we might, it's almost sure that there were regulations of this type. And I wonder if with the coinage decree, there is an extension of regulations for uh, coinage to uh, weights and measurements. Yeah. So, Anne, um, I don't know whether you've looked at uh, this coinage from uh, Lesbos and the uh, Aeolus Mesi on the Troas that Anaren and I are working on. Yeah. But because I've always sort of uh, agreed with the dates you proposed for the decree, but it is interesting, you know, that after the Mytilenean revolt, uh, Athens stops Lesbos's bill and coinage. And suddenly you have on Lesbos itself at Mytilene and Antissa, and then at, at 12 or 15 mints on the on the mainland, suddenly all striking an adequate coinage based on a dram, a hemidram, a, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an obols, and hemi obols, uh, on the attic standard. And, you know, the issue is, is was this sort of regulated or, or did people just figure this out on their own? It's hard to believe, at least on a local level, Lesbos on Lesbos itself, that Mytilene wasn't forced to strike on an attic standard. Um, and so there is at least some history here in the 420s for some monetary involvement by the Athenians in, 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 the, in their empire, you know, actually at the coinage level. And so how that fits in with the history of the decrees and what came before it, I, you know, I don't know, I have the answer, but it's clear that, that these decrees don't come out of nowhere. No, they, no, no, no. This is where they don't come out of nowhere. And also the choice of the cities. Uh, Thasos, which is a, a, a magnificent coinage of the late Archaic period and the first half of the 5th century, we have this weight of 8.6 grams after a certain moment. They begin from 12, from 12 grams and they are, they are alive to 8.6 8 .6 something. Something happens. Indeed. So right. probably we need to wait for another for another decree. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Thank you. Speak only for <laughs> only for yeah. Uh, yeah. about coins and not about measurements and uh, um, and um, how, how you say meta uh, because this is clear. It is it is clear that this is for uh, for commodities for wine, for wheat, for whatever they could export or import. Agreed. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right. Selene, Yali, mia fora, efarustume parapoli. Gostas, efarustopoli, because you gave me the possibility to see the coinage decree again, and finally one day I will finish this long paper about nomos and nom is my hope. <laughs> well, let's hope. I hope. Yeah. But... No, it's very much looking forward to that. Thank you um, very much. All right. So, uh, John, what do we have on board for next week's long table? So for next Friday, May 3rd, we have long table 181 titled Coin Finds from Olympia, analysis from 1875 to the present day. And that will be given by Dr. Simone uh, Keelan uh, and it concerns the excavation of coins, the ongoing excavations at the sanctuary of Zeus and Olympia. Fantastic, mm -hmm. more Greek, so, so yeah. stay tuned. All right, thank you very much and, uh, and Selene. Time for your dinner, I'm sure, if, if uh, or bed, maybe. Time to cook my dinner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kalanita. Hello, Vladi. Yes, I'm Happy to see all of you. Bye-bye. Yeah.